And I do want to get your response to those comments uh, from Uber about about uh, the, the fact that arguably the regulations that are being put in place here in New York City uh, are creating this secondary medallion system. Yeah, it's an, in, it's an interesting and attractive analogy at first because it's a cap and the medallion system is a cap. But there's a lot of aspects about the four higher licenses um, that, that make it very different than the medallion system. First of all, medallions aren't, are transferable and four higher licenses that Uber uses for their cars are not transferable. And the second is scarcity. So what made the medallion system and makes it so unusual is that this false sense of scarcity drives up the asset's value. But here you have over 120,000 licenses and one in five people are choosing not to renew. And that's generally just not a sign of scarcity, that's a sign of excess. So one of the things uh, that Uber did say was that their business is suffering in some of these key neighborhoods in New York City that are maybe underserved in terms of public transportation that would need ride sharing services the most. I mean, how do you how do you, I guess, counter that problem with these regulations? Because it would seem that based on their business model, that is exactly what they're saying. Yeah, and I think they've pointed out a, a few um, specific neighborhoods. And, you know, if you look at sort of areas like the Bronx, which if you look at as a whole, and that's as a, a, a borough where the income is generally, you know, 30 percent lower than the national average for a household. Um, but there they've actually seen in the last few quarters almost a 40, 40 plus percent rise in ride. So there is certainly growth still happening in the boroughs and that's very important. And it's also a matter of choices that you make in business strategy. So some people, um, some mobility operators in New York City like City Bike or Revel, the new electric scooter, have offered discounts for low income uh, people. Um, Uber this summer introduced like the Uber Copter, so that caters to a different clientele. So it's really about the choices you want to make, um, but there's certainly ridership growth in the boroughs and there's certainly ridership growth in the Bronx. Mira, I wonder what's the right model here? Because in a way, I mean, public transportation isn't market based. And so having Uber, Lyft, these different ride sharing services in the same market. Uh, trying to, they say, uh, serve those at the lower end of the income distribution. It sounds good, but, but I wonder whether market distortion actually works in transportation the way it does in, in any other capitalist market. Yeah, I mean, you raise a good point. There's a lot of subsidy in public transportation, and so you know, one of the ways to try to help mirror the equity that you see um, in public transportation in some of the private providers is to ensure that those cars are constantly being used. So the whole ecosystem is profiting, um, including the drivers, and there's constant circulation of the cars. So I think things like um, the utilization rate, which New York has introduced and, and I think other cities are looking towards, to try to make sure there are less empty cars on the street and there's more cars in service um, are excellent approaches. And I think they're actually approaches that are very aligned with the underlying goals of the companies. Hey, Mira, obviously it's not the first time Uber's uh, sort of had to wrestle with the municipality. There's, there's London. They've gone through this in Miami. But in terms of these cruising limits, um, I wonder how widespread do you think that might be? How many more cities could adopt something like it? Um, I, you know, I, it makes a lot of sense because it gives some flexibility to the companies to adapt to them um, without, um, and, and really focuses on the genuine problem, which is empty cars. So I think a lot of cities are going to really look to New York um, to see if they can adopt similar approaches. A study that Uber and Lyft put out recently shows that there are similar problems. Forty percent of the time, drivers in San Francisco, um, for example, are without a passenger clogging streets. So these are, you know, recognized problems, and this is a, a valuable data-driven approach uh, that I think makes a lot of sense. So, Mira, given the fact that you did uh, used to head up the, the TLC Commission here, uh, and the fact that you are now in, in your new position with NYU, uh, in in a position to be talking to other cities about how they're thinking about regulation and, tra and transportation overall as well. What would you expect the landscape in a major city like New York, but also other major cities around, around the world as well, what would you expect the regulatory landscape to shape up and look like in the coming years overall? 
Uh, it should, let's hope, shape up to be sort of a da data-driven approach. So that is these jurisdictions, and I think a lot more of them, you see Chicago, uh, Washington, being much more active about requiring basic data, not private data, not passenger data, but basic data about how much these cars are on the street and how often they have passengers, and using that data to inform policy making. And there is larger national movements and international movements about developing data standards so that this can be done in a consistent way across cities. But throughout my research with, with NYU, every major city you talk to, this is a reoccurring theme. They need to manage the street space. And the best way to do it is when you're talking about the same thing. So both the company and the city have a very granular and a mutual understanding of what's going on on their city streets and how to manage it.